Uh, professor Ed Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics in the Faculty of the Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, where he has taught since 1992. He regularly teaches microeconomics theory and occasionally urban and public economics. He served as director of the Tavern Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport, Center, uh, Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. Um, his work is focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers of idea transmission. Um, and that's where I first learned about um, Ed Glazer through his uh, book, Triumph of the City, and one of his earlier papers, The Skilled City. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1992. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Ed Glazer. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you so much for including me in this amazing event. I think we can all agree that university cities are amazing places, and they are really places where the future of America looks brightest. Part of the great challenge is figuring out how to harness that magic in the service of the country as a whole, and that's part of what I'm going to be talking about today. So Daniel Patrick Moynihan, this quote is at the back of the brochure, it's, it's a remarkably prescient quote, when asked, how is it that you build a great city, he, his response was to build a world-class university and then wait 200 years. And uh, it turns out that he was right. Cities have endured, cities have succeeded, cities have thrived throughout the world, but not all cities have, have thrived. And university cities, skilled cities, cities that survive on their brains, are the cities that have done well. So what I'm gonna try and talk about is why university cities. I'm gonna talk about the interplay between the city and the region. We have six really interesting university cities highlighted that, that experience different parts of America, and different roles to play in those parts of America. And then finally, I'm gonna end by talking a bit about uh, how university cities reach their potential. Now, cities have come back, but of course, it has been far from uniform. What I'm showing you here is along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, is the share of the population with a college degree. Along the y-axis, along the vertical axis, is GDP per capita across metropolitan areas. There is extraordinary heterogeneity in America, right, between places like Bakersfield that are very, very low in, in terms of formal skilling and very, very poor, to places like San Jose, California, that are extraordinarily wealthy and extraordinarily well-educated. Skills really are destiny. And the the reason why skills have become so important for cities is what saved cities in the 21st century, in the late 20th century, is that globalization and new technologies radically increased the returns to being smart. They radically increased the returns to being skilled. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. In some sense, it is our greatest asset, is our ability to you know, be intellectual magpies, to, to steal ideas from the people that are around us. Right? It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote 120 years ago, that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Skilled cities, university cities, are places where there are more ideas in the air to be exchanged. They're places where it is easier to learn from people around us. You know, one of the things that's interesting about cities is that when people come to cities, they don't immediately become more productive. What happens is that year by year, month by month, they experience faster wage growth, which is really compatible with the view that cities are forges of human capital, places where we get smart by being around other smart people, and that particularly happens in university cities. Another word that I'm going to throw out is, is human capital externalities, which is the, the effect that happens that when we get smart by being around other people. Enrico Moretti is, is the scholar who's probably done the most to document these in recent decades. And, and the sort of fact is that holding your years of schooling constant as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings also go up by 10%. Now, um, not only are skills associated with earnings, they're also associated with growth. This is county level growth across the US. I've split America's 3,000 odd counties up into five bins, equally sized in terms of numbers of counties. And you can see pretty much all of the population growth has been in the most skilled counties of the US, really a huge gap. Of course, there's nothing particular to the US about this. If you look in the developing world, right, and I'm showing you here now results for Brazil, India, China, and the US, 
you see effects of local education that are, if anything, stronger. If you want to ask which cities in India, in Brazil, and especially in China, have managed to enter into the 21st century and thrive, they are the skilled places of the world. And we can do interesting experiments because not Chinese policy hasn't always been perfectly rational. Um, so one of the problems, of course, with, with I claiming that there's a skilled city effect is that skilled people may be going to places that are naturally successful. Right? That's probably not true in the case of university cities since these, since these universities, these land-grant colleges were put here long before there was anything else. But you know, in the 1950s, China randomly reallocated academic departments for political reasons that were completely unrelated to anything that looks like common sense, at least the way I look at it. Um, and what you can then look 60 years later is the cities that got academic departments thrown in seemingly randomly have been doing much, much better than the cities that had them, had them removed. Um, so we're specifically shining a light on six university cities today. Six fairly amazing places, all successful in their own way, but all with different regions, all with different stories. So uh, we're, of course, here in Lexington, a city of about 318,000 people, 40% with college degrees, um, a, a regional success. Also something of what we call a consumer city, and I'll come back to this again. A place that actually attracts people who want to be here to live here, to be near the horses, to be near the rolling hills, not just because they're more productive here, but because it's be a beautiful place to be. Um, Durham Chapel Hill. Now, it was mentioned that these were not post-industrial cities. Durham is the only one of these that really does qualify as a post-industrial city. It was a, a giant in the tobacco trade in the 20th century. Um, and it has transformed itself into really one of the great hubs of the information age. Right? This, this region is really a tremendous success, and it also is the one that qualifies as being coastal. Lincoln, Nebraska, a state capital. Right? A place that is in the western heartland. I'll come back to this in a second. When you think about the flyover states of America, there really are two heartlands, the west and the east, and their fortunes have been very different. And both Lincoln and Fort Collins are in this western heartland that has had far fewer of the problems that have plagued the eastern heartland of the United States. Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? an amazing academic institution, a place that many people think could have saved Detroit if, in fact, the University of Michigan had actually been in Detroit as opposed to being... Uh, far too many miles, miles away. Madison, Wisconsin, another state capital, another remarkably beautiful place. That's another thing that many of these cities have in common. And of course, Fort Collins, you know, arguably the most beautiful of them all in terms of, uh, and it's certainly also a consumer city. All six of them combine high education, high quality of life, right? uh, high, uh, and generally reasonable housing prices. And that's one thing that I'm going to come back to, that it is crucial that these cities be able to grow if they're going to power their regions. And one of the things to wa watch against is that they become as restrictive in their housing policies as many coastal cities do, where they zone out growth and ensure that those cities become boutique towns affordable only to the wealthy. Um, so let's look at some maps. So this is Wisconsin, and here I'm showing you unemployment rates. This is Dane County where the red line is, that's, uh, that's where Madison is, and you'll see they've ranked all the counties by education. Dane is not, not, you know, some relatively good performer. It's by far the best performer in all of Wisconsin in terms of, of unemployment rates, really a, a spectacular uh, sign. This is Lancaster uh, County in Nebraska, so this is, this is Lincoln. Uh, here are incomes, and Lancaster, of course, is in the highest group of the Nebraska counties in, in terms of, of incomes. Uh, this is North Carolina, also uh, uh, income. Um, you have Orange and Durham counties here. Um, you know, bright green success over 10% above, above the state average, as opposed to these great oceans of red that also exist uh, in North Carolina. Uh, this is southeastern Michigan. Again, you know, this is Ann Arbor in terms of income growth. It was already mentioned that these cities had done particularly well in weathering the Great Recession, and they, they have indeed. Uh, and you can see the sort of tantalizing distance between Ann Arbor and the suffering of Detroit. Right? And, and, you know, Ann Arbor exists in this eastern heartland region that has been particularly hit by a post-industrial world. It provides a, a one vision of success in that region. Um, but of course, it's the spatial difference between Ann Arbor and Detroit makes it harder for the Detroit area to come back. And finally, I couldn't get any good maps of Fort Collins, but gosh, it is beautiful there. And, uh, uh, and you know, Colorado State is a great educational asset as well. And this is a place that you know, every other city on the list recognizes that, that this, is a, you know, this is a consumer city to beat. This is a place that attracts people for, for lifestyle. Um, now, we're in Kentucky, which in some sense is 
the most, uh, it feels like the most riven apart state in the Union, right? It feels like the most unequal, diverse place. Where you have places like Lexington, right? And you see in the center of the state, the dark blue means is education, the big red means income, right? It's relatively prosperous, it's extremely well-educated, it's a place that's full of vision and energy, and you see a future for, for you know, Kentucky and for America. And then you see the areas in eastern Kentucky or southeastern Kentucky. You know, these are huge gulfs between an, uh, shares of adults with more than 40% college degrees versus shares of adults with less than 10% with college degrees. And yet this is all within the state of Kentucky, enormous diversions. This is another place that makes it even starker. So this is life expectancy at birth. And that's you know, one of the many things that go along with education is you know, death. Uh, uh, so you know, the gap is between 78 years in you know, Fayette or Shelby, my own Kentucky ancestors lived in Shelby, um, to areas where you have seven years, eight year life expectancy gap, just enormous and, and, and tragic. And this west-east divide in some sense mirrors the larger gap between the eastern and western heartland of the US. And, I'm particularly obsessed with non-employment of prime age males in America. I think in some sense it's America's largest unsolved social problem. We've gone from a world in which when I was born 50 years ago, less than one in 20 prime age males were jobless, right? And that had been by and large the post-war norm. Today it's you know, more than 15%. Right, over 50 years, there's been a constant secular increase, goes up a lot during downturns and then moves back slightly, but joblessness continuing to rise. And I think it's really important when you think about inequality in this country, that in fact, joblessness is a far worse curse than earning a little bit less. If you look at measures of human misery, if you look at un unhappiness, if you look at suicide, if you look at divorce rates, if you look at illness, joblessness is just an incredible curse on America. Um, and it is a curse that is disproportionately found in this eastern heartland, in states like Kentucky. But again, it's the eastern Kentucky, it's not the western Kentucky. In West Virginia, obviously, and in the deep south. Um, <laughs> These, this is the curse that goes along with joblessness, right? Opioid deaths. So this is drug poisoning fatalities, again a map. Again you see this eastern heartland standing out as being the region of America that is most troubled. And this is the larger regional picture that I'm trying to push. University cities are fantastic, but they will be far more fantastic if they are able to lift their entire regions, if they're able to do more for the whole uh, area around them. Um, this is rates of disability. So disability insurance is the public policy that accompanies uh, the rise, the rise in joblessness. Again, the same pattern, the sort of deep blue in the in the eastern heartland. So I'm going to show you a few graphs of the divergence of three parts of America. And again, part of my point here is that America is not flyover states and then you know the coast. There are at least three major regions to think about: eastern heartland, western heartland, and the coastal states. So I'm going to divide that. This is sort of a funny division here. Um, I'm actually dividing by the year 1840. So the states that are included here are the states that were in the Union as of 1840 rather than, rather than afterwards. So in some sense, we're grouping on age and there, just in case you didn't believe me, these were the states as of 1840. Um, so um, usually I tend to think about Sunbelt versus not Sunbelt, so we're doing a slight division on that, but the Sunbelt still is important. There's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area population growth over the 20th century than January temperature. Right? Now, there are a lot of things that are wrapped up in that. So one part of it is the fact that the Sunbelt has had relatively pro-business policies over the last 60 years. So the work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota compares those counties that are on pro-business sides of state lines to those counties that are on anti-business sides of state lines after World War II. Finds huge industrial growth in the pro-business uh, sides of these, these state lines. Another part of it is being pro-mass production of housing. You cannot understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Phoenix, uh, you know, each added a million people between 2000 and 2010 as metropolitan areas without understanding that they make it very, very easy easy to mass produce housing, right? as opposed to Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, that do not. And it, it's not that you know, Boston doesn't grow because it's so unproductive, it's Boston doesn't grow because to a first order approximation, they allow exactly zero homes to be built in the greater Boston area. Um, which again, is something that educated people help make happen. So it's the curse of education is that they decide they want to keep things as they are and choke off regional growth. And I've seen this around me in Boston, which for all of its blue state love of affordable housing, does a terrible job of actually delivering affordable housing relative to red state Texas, which does a fantastic job of providing 
affordable housing, even though they didn't actually think that they were doing it, other than not regulating it. Um, but let's, let's face it, some portion of this is actually just sunshine. That as uh, trans transportation costs declined, as American businesses were freed up from being near those waterways, freed up from being near to the old transportation network that anchored the old Rust Belt, people moved to places that they wanted to live. And apparently they wanted to live in places that you know, were warmer. And I can say, as a New Englander, that I show, think that this shows a terrible lack of character on the part of America. Uh, but at the same time, there's no denying that it's, that it's a, a major fact. And it's something that actually goes along with the differences between these university cities, that they all have a slightly different character depending on where they are. And of course, Kentucky is fascinating because it's just on the edge of the Sun Belt, right? That it, it went from being not a right-to-work state to being a right-to-work state in, in you know, recent years. So um, one typography of the university cities is coastal versus Sun Belt. So Durham Chapel Hill is clearly Sun Belt. And you know, it's benefited by both having rules that were pro-development and also by having lots of education. And often, the skilled Sun Belt places, the Austins, the Charlottes, the Atlantis, the Durhams, are often the most dynamic parts uh, of America. Two are eastern heartland, Ann Arbor and Lexington. Lexington, of course, sort of on the, on the edge. Um, but Ann Arbor, you know, in the midst of a, of a region of difficulty, finding its own success. Um, two are squarely Western heartland. Uh, Fort Collins and Lincoln, and they're doing particularly well, but in generally successful states, right? In some sense, they benefit from the from the tailwinds that are benefiting them, but they have less of a you know less of a public role to play in terms of lifting up uh, difficult areas. Um, you know, and moreover, the success of the West is not foreordained. It's not it's not that you know they're not going to need skills. And I want to highlight Scott's point, and this goes back to the work of Finus Welch and T. W. Schultz in the 1960s. Often, you see the impact of skills most squarely in times of stress. That in fact. If everything's going well, you can get along without knowing a lot. It's when your region is hit that having skills really gives you the power to reinvent yourself. And Madison is mixed, right? It's on the edge of Western and Eastern, Eastern heartlands as well. So let me show you some, some graphs from coastal, Western, and Eastern heartlands. So this is this employment rate that I started with as being a big difference between the areas. Um, so going back to 1980, they're all looking pretty good. If anything, the Western heartland has a higher employment rate than the other regions. Uh, they've all declined somewhat. The Western heartland has actually been the most robust in terms of prime age male employment. And I, I should say I'm focusing on men not because in any sense uh, joblessness is a, is a bigger problem among men than among women, but it's less complicated. That in fact, female employment, female labor force participation has, has had a large arc over the past 70 years, and it just means something different, and actually interpreting it is, is somewhat more challenging. Um, OK, Eastern Heartland, you know, by far the worst performer of these areas. And the coastal states actually between the two on this, that actually the Western Heartland looks the best in this. Total GDP growth, again, coastal and Western Heartland buying neck and neck over the last 30 years. Eastern Heartland, woefully behind in terms of GDP growth of, of these areas. Um, manufacturing GDP growth, Western Heartland still way up ahead. Right? And I'm very big on pushing the notion that the future of American cities is not about manufacturing, that in fact it's not, you know, in part because manufacturing is just very space intensive. When Henry Ford was innovating 100 years ago, his industrial workers needed about 200 square feet per person. Today, car factories use 2,000 square feet per person. And you can imagine a factory with 200 square feet per, per person in the center of Detroit. You just can't imagine one with 2,000 square feet per person doing it. And you know, American manufacturing will continue to thrive, but it will thrive in a very capital, very technology-intensive way, not one that's providing tons of employment for less skilled Americans. Um, Eastern Heartland, of course, the poorest performer in terms of this. GDP per worker, here the coastal states uh, stand out as being the highest performer, but still a little bit of room between Western and Eastern Heartland. And working population growth, here, the Western Heartland is way up in front. Um, you know, it's the area that has had the fastest population growth over the last uh, 40 years for the US. And this is the last one, again, getting back to the tragedy uh, that lurks in the heart of many, many American states. This is mortality. Uh, and for much of the period, you see declines. And then, particularly in the Eastern Heartland, it stops. And this is a fact that Anne Case and Angus Deaton have particularly emphasized. But the end of declining mortality for prime-aged American males. Um, now, that's not true everywhere. The coastal states have done fine in terms of mortality. The western heartland has done fine. It's the eastern heartland that has been the absolute disaster on this. One final thing, this is the change in the employment rate. 
so you can see, you know, Michigan and Kentucky are both places that have, have look among the worst in the in the country in terms of declining employment rates. Uh, Louisiana being uh, and Mississippi being a particular extreme. This is drug poisoning fatalities by state. You can see Kentucky's uh, way up there, a little bit below West Virginia. But of course, you know, states in the Western Highland, like Nebraska, are at the opposite extreme. Right, so just a very different regional context for these, these university cities. Now, my model of regional growth is very simple. It's about schools and rules. Right? It's my model of national growth as well. It's about having institutions that favor entrepreneurship, employment growth, right? and it's about having skills. And you can succeed with as long as you have some kind of good combination of these two areas. So this is education. Um, and you know this has been the big secret of coastal success. Massachusetts manages to do reasonably well despite having rules that are deeply inimical uh, for e economic growth. Despite basically saying you know saying no to every entrepreneur they could possibly say no to, uh, they manage still to grow because of their because of their skills. Right? Texas manages to grow with less education, but because they have rules that are very pro uh, pro growth. Both strategies tend to work, and the right answer is to find some sort of sweet spot between the two, uh, between the two, uh, the balance the two. This is um, education for the three regions. So you can see that the Western Heartland started out with a real benefit, a real educational advantage over the Eastern Heartland. Um, the coastal states, however, have moved ahead much more quickly in terms of education. And this is one of the big challenges that I lay on the, on the, you know, on the heads of the, our representatives of the university cities in, in the Western Heartland, right? That Educational growth has slowed in those areas. Those areas which were the birthplace of the high school movement in the US. Right? The university cities of the Western Heartland need to keep making the case that education is the secret sauce that fuels regional growth. They need to keep on emphasizing that just as they do in Kentucky. The Eastern Heartland has had some catch up, but it's starting from a lower base. And that's been part of the challenge. And of course, the places that started with less education were hit by this manufacturing transformation. So uh, this is coal mining uh, in Kentucky. And uh, I like this graph because it shows us that what's happened in Kentucky over the last 40 years is not that we stopped mining coal in Kentucky. They're still mining plenty of coal. They just don't use people to do it in the same way. Now, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. My, my wife's grandfather was, was mining in eastern Pennsylvania. And he went into the mines at 11 and died at 59. And you know, he was well paid for that. He put two daughters through college. With, with that, but that was a tough life, a brutal life. But we need to figure out other things for prime age males to do, almost assuredly in the service sector. The problem with that is that, you know, we middle-aged men are, are not always so great at being nice to people. And part of the critical element of success in the service sector is actually being nice to people. Um, so that's employment. Another problem, obviously, is new technologies like opioids. So opioids comes in and hits. This is not just any opioids. These are uh, generic opioids. So these are particularly cheap opioids. So this is, uh, uh, which have come in, hit areas of misery, hit areas in which we had a welfare state that supported people going on disability and having uh, paying for prescriptions. And these ended up being in terrible scourge that we didn't think through. And it's often the case that when you have existing social problems, you add in something new, some new opportunity, it can actually make things worse. I think about the terrible rise in mortality after Russia opened up to the West in the 1990s, where rising incomes led to a great, you know, a, a great alcohol uh, binge that ended up causing the lives of, of Russians to get shorter, not longer. Um, and of course, this is one measure of the welfare state. These are uh, federal government expenditures per capita by state. And you can see that these are particularly high in the areas, again, of the Eastern Heartland. Uh, places that were hit by post-industrialization. And often those federal benefits, while well-meaning, right, can have unfortunate counter effects. Right? The way that disability taxes employment is deeply problematic. And there's great work that's been done on Norwegian reforms of disability that enabled disabled workers to actually take home more of the cash benefits of the earnings that they take. And they've shown that the disabled workers have actually gone back to work in larger numbers uh, as a result. We should rethink those incentives. Um, schools and rules. So again, the Eastern Heartland looks unique in terms of rules. This, these are measures of corruption by state. Corruption is actually strongly correlated with education. Um, the way we typically measure corruption by state is with federal cases against local officials. So you know, a properly corrupt state will not police its own, obviously. So you can't count on you know, Louisiana DAs taking on Louisiana officials. But the feds will go after them. So these are usually federal, federal cases per capita. Uh, this correlates negatively with economic 
economic growth at the local level correlates negatively with education at the local level. Um, and you know, this is the this is the area. And, and this is you know, I'm not saying that fighting corruption is the most important thing, but it's indicative of the political problems that often build up over time, uh, particularly in places with education uh, deficits. So what went wrong with the Eastern Highland? I think from Louisville North, the region inter industrialized early, which meant both less appetite for public schooling, right? Because you could go into the factory early on, you didn't actually need public education. It also meant you didn't have off seasons that the farm kids did in which you could educate kids. In South, the cotton economy and the legacy of slavery limited investments in schooling as well. Um, low education is associated with more corruption. And I just want to quote Thomas Jefferson on this. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. I think Jefferson is right on this. The correlation between education and democracy is strong. It's hard to make a really strong causal link there. But you know, human capital tends to defend its institutions. And that's another role for university cities, right? Political engagement. Engagement, political improvements, not just Mayor Gray's office, but the, the state fighting to make sure that Kentucky and Wisconsin and Nebraska are as well governed as they could possibly as they could possibly be. Um, limited political corruption in the one party south enabled, enabled corruption. And of course, Manker Olson in his, in his work sort of brilliantly emphasized the way that institutional rent seeking corruption of a variety of forms tends to accrete over time, right? And in some sense, the Western heartland benefits from being newer. It has less of these negative institutions that have built up. The coasts, of course, have plenty of them, but in some sense, the stronger educational of, of many of the coastal cities has enabled more of a fight to occur. Um, okay. and. Uh, you know, while corruption is a hard thing to take on, things like extra licensing requirements, things like various barriers to entrepreneurship, those are easier to take on. This is a map of, which again shows the Eastern Heartland pattern, um, states that have to license opticians versus not. You know, uh, it's clearly really important that opticians be licensed because they might, you know, give you a, a frame which doesn't really look right on your face. They might give you a round frame when you actually need a square frame or something like that. Um, so it's really important that we have this licensing. The rise of occupational licensing has been a national phenomenon. And it's one that we have never really properly put through cost-benefit analysis. You know, please don't think that I am, have any sort of you know, knee-jerk opposition to all forms of regulation or all forms of licensing. Much of my work is on the cities of the developing world, where I am a strong advocate of various regulations around real sanitary reforms that actually need to occur in these areas. And certainly, I, am, I was in favor of more, not less, banking regulation after 2007 in, in the US. But there are things, like opticians, that actually don't need to be licensed. And you know, food trucks, for example, which are a great way of delivering low-cost foods by innovative entrepreneurs in urban areas, I, I, you know, I see no reason why we can't make it easier to, to permit food trucks. And yet so many cities make it difficult. Why? Because they're protecting insiders. And that's exactly the story of Detroit, where I was engaged in this, this NPR show about five years ago for this cause celebre, which is the Pink Flamingo, this poor woman who had been trying to start her food truck in Detroit for 18 months. Now, and, you know, she hadn't been able to get through the regulatory uh, web. Now, the idea that Detroit should be saying no to any entrepreneur who wants to get started is just absolutely insane. Um, but so we're on this NPR show. They've also got the city ombudsman. And after an hour right, of, you know, I'm beating up on the guy, she's beating up on the guy, the host's beating up on the guy, every caller is unanimously beating up on this poor city ombudsman who's just trying to do his job. He says, oh, the lady, go ahead and just start your food truck. We'll never catch you. Uh, <laughs> um, and the, the, the larger point, right, is that we make it far easier in this country to be a, you know, a rich person entrepreneur than to be a poor person entrepreneur. If you want to start your internet startup and operate in cyberspace, no one's going to stop you. If you want to start a food truck or a bodega or an ordinary coffee shop that sells milk products, at least in Boston, you've got 18 permits to go through, right? And we have a need for one-stop permitting, people who speak the languages of the people in the areas and people and having permitting czars who can be judged by the speed with which they deliver answers. Um, okay, human capital is more important than physical capital, right? This is a general theme that I'm going to make, right? that in fact, the response often to declining regions is to invest in infrastructure. You heard it again in the latest, latest lecture. Now, we actually do need to invest in maintaining our infrastructure. This is not what I'm, I'm saying. And there are smart infrastructure investments that we can make. But thinking that infrastructure is going to save declining regions like Appalachia was a mistake 50 years ago, and it remains a mistake today, right? So this is a map of the Appalachian highways. Uh, this is from work that I did about 
10 years ago. Yes, there was a bump up in the 1970s from being part of the Appalachian regional area. Again, we're using a, a way of trying to, to e find reasonably comparable counties to compare. Over the 30 years, it made absolutely no difference, at least in our finding, that all of these infrastructure heavy policies did very little. And you see this in individual cities, right? You know, seeing things like Detroit's people move or monorail, right? Which is an atrocity that glides, you know, over emptily over empty streets. What Detroit needed was better schools and safer streets for its kids. It did not need some form of Disney World inspired, you know, uh, infrastructure to, to help itself. Um, what we need is better schools. And Kentucky has been active in the space of school reform for 30 years. For 30 years, governors of Kentucky have argued with this, but the pace has been slow. And that's been true everywhere. This shows ACT scores by year. Small take-ups, they're bounce backs when more people take the ACT. That isn't a sign that things are going badly. But the path is, is slow. And this is an area in which university cities play an absolutely critical role, because we need ju not just education that's lifting the bottom, but education at the top. We need those new ideas that are responsible for new economic growth, for new economic development. So why do university cities matter? I think most importantly, the right economic development strategy at the local level is to attract and train smart people and then get out of their way. Universities do that. They do that with their students. They do that with their faculty. They do that with affiliated businesses. It's their most important role. They create spin-offs from relevant research, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second. They have a global outlook. In some sense, you know, the successful cities of the early 19th century, just like the successful cities of the early 21st century, are marked by three things. Smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world, right? Very different from the industrial city of 1910, but that is the future. University cities have that. They have the capacity to foment entrepreneurship, they, and they always have a global outlook. Almost every serious academic is well-traveled, has some degree of connections to the outside world. Um, quality of life improvements. We already heard about the great cultural institutions that are, are in university cities. Sometimes helpful policy and political engagement, which is not to say that every policy idea that comes out of an academic's mouth is necessarily the most sensible thing in the world. Uh, so it's usually a combination of good and bad. And sometimes evaluation of policy experiments, right? So uh, evaluating schools, evaluating entrepreneurship programs. So let's just talk about a little bit of evidence. So there's a great deal of cross-sectional evidence suggesting the power of universities and the power of skills more generally. Enrico Moretti is is probably the largest player in this. I've been engaged with some of this with uh, Albert Saez. Um, and typically what we do is we look at the presence of land-grant colleges prior to 1940 in, in areas, and, and that correlates quite strongly with success. There's a, a long literature on patent spillovers from local universities showing businesses that, pat that cite patents that were originally in the university. Um, and I'm also going to show you some evidence from my former student, Naomi Hausman, on the role of universities in inculcating business startups after the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, there's, I'm not going to show you that, but there's great evidence on, on university openings in the 1960s in Germany by Simon Yeager of MIT. I'll uh, show you a little bit on Boston and the story of Silicon Valley. So first of all, just the general skills, like this is US prime male employment by, by schooling. This is the relationship between colleges per capita and in 1940 and share of the population with a bachelor's degree in 2000. Okay, a fairly strong, although albeit far from perfect correlation. One of the things that happened with colleges in 1940 is this great sorting of America that places that were initially more skilled got even more skilled. And what you're looking at here along the horizontal axis is the share of the population with a college degree as of 1940. What you're looking at along the vertical axis is the growth in the share of the population with a college degree between 1940 and 2000. So the places that had an initial skill advantage saw that skill advantage explode over the next 60 years. So uh, that's what you're looking at here, right, is this very large uh, correlation. So the places like Lexington that had a little bit of an edge really benefited from that over the next 60 years. Same thing true for Lincoln, for Durham, for Fort Collins, for Ann Arbor. Um, these are regression tables that say what I basically just said in words, that places with more universities, more land-grant colleges in 1940 end up having higher wages, higher housing prices prices, higher population growth. Um, now, Naomi's work looks at the Bayh-Dole Act. So prior to 1980, you could not patent research that was funded with federal grants. After 1980, you could. This shows what's happened to university patents over between 1976 and uh, to 1997. And during the 1970s, before the Bayh-Dole Act, it was really pretty flat. It was really pretty sleepy. And then suddenly the Bayh-Dole Act said, you know what, this stuff, you can commercialize it. Go ahead. Go start your businesses. And suddenly you see university patents exploding over time. Right? This is an almost five-fold increase over a less than 20-year period. And what we see is that by focusing on the industries that the university was strong in prior to 1980, we can ask, were there spillovers to local businesses? And that's exactly what Naomi does. She finds that there's a whole rush 
of openings of businesses in the areas the university had been good at, but had previously been prevented from, from capitalizing on. So places like Bozeman, Montana, which had been sleepy in 1980, suddenly had a whole bunch of startups in industries that were related to the college. And certainly, we see this in every one of the university cities that we're talking about. The research triangle around Durham is particularly prone to this. Um, we see this in Massachusetts as well. This is just the regression format, where you know our, everyone know our Langbrand College? Our Langbrand College is called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, right? MIT is our own Langbrand College. So anyone who says that Langbrand Colleges can't be great at commercializing research, you know, just visit Kendall Square, right? It's all about commercializing, it's all about commercializing research, and they do spectacularly well. What you're looking at here is the concentration of tech firms in Greater Boston. There are two great centers, one of which is the Route 128 corridor, which in some sense is the old center. Right? It's a center that's grounded by highways, by large office parks, but it's a center that even then had its start in MIT, because the ur company for this was Raytheon, which was founded by Vannevar Bush, who was a great MIT scientist. Um, and of course, the new tech center is the, is Kendall Square, is the area around MIT, a place that felt like it was sleepy and dying 25 years ago when I came, came to Harvard, where my predecessors at Harvard declared that unless the federal government bailed out Cambridge's candy industry, because of course we had been the candy capital of New England, Necco Wafers, New England confectionery company, uh, right, dying, unless it got bailed out, you know, Cambridge would never never survive. All of those candy factories now have biotech firms in them, right? They're all, they're all well occupied, they're all thriving. And, you know, they're slightly different model. Uh, can Kendall Square has, you know, tends to have more small firms, but um, uh, Kendall Square has had more growth in small establishments, Route 120 has had more growth in big establishments. There are different models. One is highly walkable, one is highly dense, the other one is more car oriented. Both models can work, right? America is great in some sense because it has a variety of different ways in which people can live. And great cities are archipelagos of neighborhoods where people can choose different areas. So I think the key thing in terms of the future of all these university cities is thinking about having different pockets that can accommodate different types of businesses. Um, Entrepreneurship, right, is a very hard thing to measure, but it is remarkable given how mediocre our measures are of entrepreneurship that they do such a good job of predicting urban success. One of those measures is average establishment size, right, so having lots of little firms in an initial time period. Another is the share of employment in startups in an initial time period. So what you're seeing here is across American metropolitan areas, the relationship between small establishment sizes and employment growth. Massive difference, right, massive difference between those places that looked like they were more entrepreneurial for 40 years ago, uh, and subsequent growth. This is not just about region, this holds within every metropolitan area, it holds across industries, it holds however you want to look at it. Um, and it also holds if you use things like the existence of mines in an area in 1910, because mines tended to mean big business, and those big businesses tended to crowd out smaller businesses. And the places that benefited from access to coal and iron uh, 100 years ago have paid the price today, and that they've had very large firms that have crowded out uh, entrepreneurship. Now, uh, coming to the end here, and I, I want to end on, on one story and then just talk a little bit about things that I think the university cities can do. But in some sense, that's going to be the topic of the rest of today, is things university cities can do. Um, I want to start with the story of Stanford which it's hard to think of a more successful university in the public realm than Stanford, especially as an economic engine. Silicon Valley rests on Stanford, right? This great economic engine for America rests on Stanford. And it reminds us, of course, you know, because there's no region that is more restrictive of housing in Silicon Valley, of what a terrible thing it can be when a region succeeds economically and then basically says that no one else can move in, right? And, you know, start our home, start at two million bucks. And, you know, this in some sense is the opportunity that all of these university cities have, that they're facing this type of, of housing, but you know it's it's a tragedy that we in fact can't move to the most productive places in America the way that we did 100 years ago, the way that we even did 50 years ago. Um, so that's Leland Stanford, and the key element with Leland Stanford's vision and the thing that made him different from John D. Rockefeller at the University of Chicago, where both Ken and Ken and I went, was Leland Stanford wanted a practical university that would be engaged with businesses that were relevant then. He was not interested in the classics. He was not interested in some East Coast Europe-looking vision of what a university could be. He wanted a university to be like himself, a practical man of business, a railroad man, a governor. Um, and that's what he got. And so Silicon Valley really starts when a telegraphy genius, a teen genius named McCarthy, dies in a freak streetcar accident in San Francisco at the start of the last century. His backers say, well, you know, it's a shame this genius died on us, but, you know, we've got this money here. We'd like to give it to somebody else. We'd like to see somebody else, this telegraphy thing, it's going to do something. We want to, we want to invest in it. So they call, who do they call? They call Stanford's engineering department. 
and they'd say, who, who do you have who could lead this effort? And you know, the, the professor that they called pointed them to his star student, Cyril Elwell, who takes the money, right? He looks at McCarthy's ideas, he, he sees that they, they won't work, and then he goes and he contracts with Waldemar Polson, the Polson arc telegraphy uh, technology of the early 20th century, and Federal Telegraph is formed. And you can see the graph here, which is the, uh, it says it's the original site of the lab laboratory and factory of Federal Telegraph Company, founded in 1909 by Cyril Elwell, here with two assistants, Lee DeForest, inventor of the three-element radio vacuum tube, devised in 1911 to 1913, the first vacuum tube amplifier and oscillator. Right? This is where it starts. Not after World War II, it starts a, you know, a, a full hundred years ago, and it starts with clear roots to Stanford. Federal Telegraph is there when the young Fred Terman, right, who his father is one of the developers of the Stanford Binet IQ test, the young Fred Terman gets summer jobs working for Federal Telegraph. He then goes off to MIT, he studies under Vannevar Bush, he comes back, he becomes a professor and dean at Stanford, and after World War II, he starts Stanford Industrial Park. He starts this great investment in the future of the region, and he attracts William Shockley, to come and, and run his uh, semiconductor operation there. Shockley turns out to be the perfect entrepreneur to jumpstart a regional ecosystem because he both attracts talent and then repels it, right? It's exactly what you want, right? He brings in, because he is brilliant, because he is a Nobel Prize winning scientist, he brings in this extraordinary cluster of genius and then you know, within a year, he's alienated them all with his behavior. So they're all gone off, they first start, start join Fairchild and then they disperse, they become the Fairchildren and it is in their genes, it is in their, their uh, creativity that they then make Silicon Valley. In the 1960s, Silicon Valley was not marked by big office complexes, it was small companies, they were nimble, they talked to each other, they met at Walker's Wagon, Wheel. They showed the power of ideas to make a regional economy grow, which is ultimately what we're all talking about in terms of university cities. Um, the, uh, the, the region even, well, we won't talk about Facebook um, and, and Cambridge Mass. That's, that's a sore, uh, that's of course a sore spot because Facebook reminds us that, you know, the greatest thing that cities do is to enable these collaborative chains of creativity that powered humanity's greatest hits since, you know, Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner, right? That's still going on around us. It's going around on us in lots of different ways. Often we see it most clearly in the arts, right? You can often see these chains in things like the, the Florentine Renaissance. So, you know, this starts with Brunelleschi's understanding of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional shapes seem three-dimensional. Brunelleschi passes it along to his young friend Donatello, who puts it on low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele, who passes it along to Masaccio, who puts it in you know, the Brancacci Chapel, marvelous painting of uh, St. Peter fighting a silver coin in the belly of a fish, passes it along to that less than saintly monk Fra Filippo Lippi, passes it along to Botticelli and so forth, a chain of genius, each person riffing on each other's ideas. Right? This is what smart cities do that actually matters. Right? Now, Facebook is another example, and I don't want to get into intellectual property dispute here. It seems to have been an example where Harvard's halls also enabled the flow of ideas which led to collaborative creativity, right? And in some sense, it continues to show the power of face-to-face -face contact and powering innovation. Unfortunately, Cambridge couldn't keep that, right? And he was drawn in by this great Silicon Valley ecosystem. You know, one of the things that I'm always asked about is, do I think that all this new technology will make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete? And I think the, I thought the answer was no 25 years ago when I first started working on this, where it seemed far less obvious, and I certainly think it's no today. And one of the most strongest pieces of evidence we have about this is that of all the industries in all the world that should be enabled to empower long distance communication, right, the number one should be Silicon Valley, should be tech. And yet Google doesn't say, go home, just dial it in, just work from wherever you want to be. They build the Googleplex. No, they don't build, they buy the Googleplex. They buy a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan, right? They bring people together and want them to be right on top of each other 24 hours a day constantly communicating with each other because that's what information does. That's how information grows. You know, anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject matter. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students, right? And we have evolved over millions of years for having these cues that communicate comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. The more complicated the world is, right, the more important it is to get those ideas across, to have the benefits of face-to-face -face contact, which is why there's no sense in which I believe that long-distance learning will be a challenge to the great universities of the world. And there's no sense that I believe that long-distance communication will make the smart cities, the university cities of the world, in any sense obsolete. 
finally, what can university cities do better? I think we're going to hear a lot about that today, but I'll just say a few things that have seemed, you know, that seemed obvious to me. First of all, there is a notorious tendency, and I come from one of the world's global capitals of town gown acrimony. Uh, there, there is a long-standing tendency of, of universities and their cities not to get along. So I've seen none of that here in Lexington. I was, I was delighted to see. But it, it, is, it is an ongoing challenge. And figuring out ways for that are both in the university and the city's interest to collaborate, right, in ways that enable university researchers to help evaluate city projects, that enable cities to um, actually see benefits from participating with the university is really crucial. Um, universities can encourage useful skills and entrepreneurship. Universities don't always do this, right? But they can actually pay a little bit of attention to actually doing the sort of things that people do in business schools, which actually promote people to actually do things that involve, involve work. Which is not to say that you know, things that don't look useful aren't useful in lots of different ways, but being actually engaged with the world around you is actually valuable, because we all have the capacity to learn from, from around this. Cities can focus on quality of life for young graduates and not putting barriers in the way of building. So very few of the you know, kids who come to Boston feel like they're bound together with the Boston metropolitan area. And that was seen as really a lost opportunity. I, I chaired the Citizens Commission for the Future of Boston at the behest of the President of the Boston City Council maybe 10 years ago. And it was amazing how many young kids just felt that the city government didn't care a darn about them. Right? That sense of you know, empowering the, the, the kids, making them feel like they're actually tied to Lincoln, Lexington, uh, Madison, Ann Arbor, uh, is really crucial for the retention strategy. Which is not to say that the retention rate should be 100%. Universities are meant to be export industries. They're meant to be taking, taking people in than, than letting them go. But I think most university cities would like to retain a little bit more, and building some sense of, of community uh, there is valuable. And then the last question is, are the rules right for students to engage in local entrepreneurship? Students are such, you know, they have so much energy, they have so much enthusiasm, so many of them want to be part of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. The question is, has the university and the city created the rules that are right for them to actually engage and for them to be, them to be helpful? So let me stop there. I think we're going to hear a lot you know, more in terms of great ideas for making, making university cities even more productive. Let me thank all of you for being engaged uh, with this today, and thank all of you who are engaged in whether or not you're building up your university or building up your cities. Thank you for all that you, uh, that you do on this, because in fact, university cities are not just vibrant, successful places. I actually believe they may well be the best hope for America. And I wanted to sort of end with that, that in fact, you know, it's easy in a university city to be complacent. You saw the data, it all looks good. That's great, right? It's wonderful that the university cities are doing so well. They are a sign of what can succeed in urban spaces. But not all of America is doing so well. And university cities will only truly succeed if they don't just succeed for their own members, but they actually power the entire region around them. They bring up, they bring up the wider area. So let me, let me end on that and then open it, open it up for questions. Okay, so Scott, what do we do? What do we do on this? Uh, you guys, you guys seem to have it under control. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, we'll run a mic to you. Yeah, and if you don't have questions, I'll start cold calling. So, uh, it's uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Logan Gardner. I do research at the Wharton School. Um, so, my question is. Uh, well, to frame it, at the end of the month, the Lexington City Council votes on the City Planning Commission's recommendation to not expand our long-standing urban services boundary. Um, in your book, you characterize NIMBYism, so not in my backyard, um, with what you call the National Law of Conservation. When environmentalists stop development in green places, it will incur in brown places. Um, so. Yet, a big chunk of our local economy and identity is in the horse industry. To protect the horse farms, our intangible assets, we must restrict development. What recommendations do you have for striking the right balance? So I think, I think you've said it exactly right, that, that balance is really critical here. So while in general, uh, I certainly am, because I, I live in one of the most nimbious places on the planet, I, I almost universally stand on the side of allowing more development in greater Boston. And I would say the same thing for San Francisco and for New York as well. It's not as if you know, I'm in favor of, of allowing every restriction on development to go down. And there really are trade-offs. Let me actually not answer on on the growth boundary on Lexington yet, let me start with historic preservation, which is always a challenge, right? That um, some historic preservation is actually quite valuable, right? Some of it creates character in an area, creates beauty, makes the place magical, right? So, I mean, it's not as if the right answer is no historic preservation. But then again, not every ultimately 
utterly mediocre glazed brick building built on the Upper East Side of Manhattan after 1945, and I grew up in such buildings, deserves preservation too, right? So there's, there's a trade-off here. The question in terms of Lexington's growth boundary is, you know, are there ways to balance growth, to balance affordable growth, with preserving the traditional beauty and charm of Lexington, right? So those horse farms are a real asset in the region, right? And they've, they've attracted wealthy people who have helped you know, and philanthropy and other things. So it's not as if, as if this is a, a, an easy thing to, uh, thing to come up with. I think the right, the right answer is making sure that you have enough growth. If you're going to protect those, those horse farms, are you allowing enough growth in other areas? Are you making it as easy as possible to do infill development? Are you, you know, making, it, making it possible for you to provide lots of homes for middle-income Americans to come, to come to Lexington while you're preserving that? If you can do that, then there's no conflict. You can do that. You can, you know, you can, you can have both, both things. If you can't, then you may have a trade-off. You may have to ask yourself whether or not the boundary has to be increased slightly. Uh, but again, there's no right answer here. You need to rigorously treat these things with cost-benefit analysis, not to say that there's one size fits all in terms of the right, the right answer. Um, so I think that's, that's the best that I can do, do on this. But you know, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the mayor's team has it right. I, uh, they, uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm David Goodnight, and I'm an uh, entrepreneurship professor here at the uh, University of Kentucky. And I've got a simple question for you. How do you shift the uh, mindset of faculty, uh, research faculty, from build it, they, it'll, they'll come, to prove it and grow it? So I think it happens slowly, um, and uh, I'm not... You know, I, I usually speak on these. I, I usually feel that I have deep insight on you know the value of entrepreneurial hum, human capital because I am myself such a company man, and so I, I, and I come from generations of company. In my mother's case, women. Uh, so I understand what not having an entrepreneurial mindset looks like. Uh, and certainly, Harvard was for many decades among the least, uh, you know, least pro entrepreneurship uh, entities in terms of the, the main heart of the university. I mean, this was certainly during. I mean, there are many things that I revere about Derek Bach during his his decades. But certainly he did not think the university should be involved in the marketplace in, in any meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Um, often it comes from the top. So often, you know, uh, a leader at the top of an organization can move things, and, and that's, you know, the easiest way for things to happen quickly. The other way it happens is, you know, uh, people start succeeding, and people get jealous of other people's Porsches, right? I mean, that's, that's the other, you know, way in which this happens. Now, it's a balance, obviously, and it's not as if you want every one of your faculty members to be focusing on their next startup relative to doing their own academic research. Um, but, uh, you know, in most, in most areas, the, there, you know, in particularly business areas there and technology areas, there's a lot to gain by by actually engaging with the real world and, and thinking about thinking about startups. And there's certainly the region has a lot to gain from it. So I think you know, uh, both top down and, and bottom up strategies make sense. And I think it's also helpful for you know local leaders to actually you know speak out at university events and say you know you know we're not asking for your money, we're just asking for your for your human capital. Just you know just just engage with our city. We're there. We want you to be part of the fabric of, of Lexington's economy. Let's let's help make a greater Lexington going forward. Other questions? Is there a difference? Sorry, is there a difference between being a um, university city and a college town? Because there seems to be a negative connotation to be a college town. I think I think it's probably if we like it, it's a university city. If we don't like it, it's a college town. That's probably right. Uh, uh, surely, university city suggests that it's it's grown larger. It's not as parochial as we sometimes think a college town will be. So it's actually got stuff in it other than the university. So I think that's that's one part of being a university city. So it's got to be engaged with with the world in some larger larger way. And I think that's you know all six of these university cities are have more in them than just the universities. Um, and even if you know let's say perhaps the most, one of them which has a university that's most dominant is Ann Arbor uh, in terms of just population uh, wise, but the University of Michigan is just so large and so dynamic that it's hard to possibly call Ann Arbor a, a college town relative to a university city. Um, so I think it, it has to do with the engagement, the outward looking nature of it and the extent to which there's mixing in that. And I, I can't emphasize you know, enough that you know, when it comes to, you know, if, if I think about sort of the first thing that we, that we need for urban success, it's skills. The, the second 
second thing is a particular form of skills, which is entrepreneurial human capital, right? And then the third thing is some degree of industrial diversity, right? The great you know, urban observer, Jane Jacobs, argued in the 1960s that you know, new ideas were formed by combining old ideas. And cities that have a multiplicity of different ideas have different things you can draw from, different things that you can combine, different industrial leaps that you can take. So think, for example, about Bloomberg, right? Michael Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire. He's an IT billionaire. Right, he's an information technology. In some sense, he's competing with the guys from Silicon Valley. He's able to compete so successfully with them because when he comes to start his business, he has run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. He's run their tech operation. And he knows something that no Stanford-trained engineer knows. He knows what the guys at Merrill Lynch want on their desks. Right? He knows what he needs to deliver. And that knowledge, which the city's industrial diversity has given him, enables him to do a cross-industry leap. And that's, in some sense, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about university towns, is the cities that go beyond merely having a siloed one industry space, which is education, to being a broader uh, sweep than that. Okay. Other, other questions? Yes, sir. I'm John Thielen. I teach at the University of Kentucky. Uh, you get a lot of mileage out of the cases of Cambridge and Palo Alto in your profiles, but I don't see them included in our roster of university cities. How come? Oh, well, I didn't make that selection. Uh, um, <laughs> I think they're, 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 I, I think there was a size cutoff that, that the, the metro areas are, are much bigger than, than that. They're, they're certainly uh, uh, well, Palo Alto is part of the San Jose metro area, or the even larger San Francisco CMSA, which is, which is vast. So I think the, 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 if you thought about places that also can compete on, you know, on low cost of living, those are both two areas that you know, do worst in terms of, of, of that dimension. So you know, the, the, it's just the challenges are the, the challenge for, for MIT is not figuring out how to connect the academy with the local economy. That challenge is met. The challenge is how to make, you know, how to make a city that more people can afford to live in and how to make sure that the benefits of that economic success spread to a wider range of the population. So it's just sort of a slightly different challenge, I think. But I think you know, we should be having a dialogue and we should be thinking about university cities more broadly. So I agree with your basic point. Okay, one, well, I'll go until Scott tells me to stop. But okay, one more. Let's, let's, uh, Actually, can I, take two can I take two questions and I'll just answer one at the end? Okay, go, go ahead. The, uh... Hi, I'm Angie Mays. I'm a librarian and data nerd here at the University of Kentucky. My question is, how do we reach out to those people in the old economy whose skills have stagnated and fallen woefully behind the technology and analysis trajectories that have that power the modern economy kind of work. Great. And someone had the hand up right back there, if you can just, just, just speak, just say what you... Uh... Um, what cultural breakthroughs do we need? Sorry, thanks. What cultural breakthroughs do we need, for example, uh, to attract uh, more people to move to university cities? Could we have, for example, a, a, baby, a baby Guggenheim here and in other university cities? Um, your question is somewhat somewhat easier. I think I think the um, the the you know as, as was already shown. I mean, the university cities typically start with being rich in terms of culture. Uh, I think the right thing is to continue with that, let that movement go forward, not to think about large you know uh, Stark Architect kind of thing that comes that gets dumped in the middle of, of nowhere. I mean, even Bill Bow, which like won the lottery in terms of being insanely successful in terms of the museum, right? You know, it's an unemployment rate; it's eighteen percent right now. Okay, which maybe better than other parts of Spain, and perhaps it's not the disaster that it once was. And most attempts to sort of plop a museum down in nowhere end up like Sheffield in England, where you know they have a, they, have a, they built a museum about rock and roll history, which closed within the year. So you know the arts really are not. It's lovely when the arts are supported by local government, but the arts is really best created by artists, not by urban planners, right? Who decide to just dump a, a museum somewhere. Now that again, you know, the two things go together, and it's a great thing when universities have art around them. But again, the creative impulses have to come from the bottom up. They, they can't come from the top down. You just you just can't legislate, you know, artistic genius. I mean, it just doesn't it just doesn't work. Um, your question is the much harder harder one, um, which is uh, especially retraining. So we we think about there being a skill mismatch in America. That in some sense is the root for the for the rising joblessness of prime age males. One part of this is handled among the very young. Is about pre K education. Is about you know lots of entrepreneurial investment for teens. You know more things that involve competitively sourced vocational training on weekends after school, where you don't just rely on you know the same tenured teacher to teach new technology skills, but you bring in other 
people. And the great thing about training someone vocationally is you can test whether or not a program worked or not right at the point of completion. You don't have to wait 10 years and look at the IRS records, right? So you can actually have a really, real strong, a really strong market in this. And if they do well, they succeed. And if they don't do well, you, you shut them down. Um, now, the harder part is retraining 50-year-olds. So we know something about training 17-year-olds. We believe that this can work. Or training 3-year-olds, even better. Retraining 50-year-old men. We've been trying to do various retraining programs for 50 years, Ken. And I don't know, would you, would you describe the, the general track record of these various forms of retraining programs as dismal or awful? Uh, it's, somewhere, it's somewhere between these. But the answer is we've been very, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks has proved, has proven to be extraordinarily difficult. And particularly middle-aged men and have done, you know, have done particularly poorly in the service in the service economy. Now, I think the right answer is learning by doing. I think more generally, in fact, you know, the, the model of, of learning by listening is a fairly fraught model at pretty much all levels of, of the age distribution. But I think it really has got to involve getting getting them back to work. And I think we should be open as a country to policies that raise the effective minimum wage, not by asking employers to pay for that, right, which you know will deter job creation, but rather by having a, something like the earned income tax credit that involves a wage subsidy that effectively boosts the wage that workers can take home uh, and tries to encourage them to get back into the workforce. But it has to be through, you know, I think it's got to be through work. I think it's not, it's not through retraining. It's by you know, getting employers who have an interest in, in hiring and getting them upskilled and finding useful employment for them. I think there's nothing else that's going to be successful on that. And with then, I will thank Scott for, for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you all for the university.